let me begin by uh, thanking God for being here. I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity. I always, before I begin my talk, I always laugh when they say I was in the dunking contest because I, I could get up, I can dunk, but I never dunked in the NBA game. So I think I broke, I made history by being in the dunking contest without ever dunking in the NBA game. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was my team's fault for, for, for putting me in it. Um, let me begin by also saying that uh, I want to thank um, Michigan State University's Muslim Studies Program. I want to thank uh, Broad Arts Museum. And I want to thank MSU Libraries uh, for the generosity of thinking about me at this, this important time in history. Uh, a time where our beloved El Hajj Malik Shabazz, 61 years ago, uh, shared the same space, spoke in this space. So for me to be here in this moment and on this day at this time, uh, I don't take lightly. Uh, I'm, I'm deeply, deeply humbled. Um, I was debating on how to begin, if I should begin by speaking about the importance of revisiting this history or how he pretty much influenced me and then going into that. I was first introduced to Malcolm, the autobiography, when I was in college. My high school, I mean my college coach Dale Brown gave me that book, this white guy from North Dakota who seemed to know almost everybody underneath the sun. And he would always give us stuff to read and, and ask us what we thought. But prior to that, and that was a turning point for me, which I'll get into. But prior to that, I grew up in this And at a young age, you know, I grew up with a mother with an eighth grade education. And so even, you know, the furthest my mother could see was getting a high school diploma because nobody in my family ever went to college. And, but it's, it's difficult. You grow up in an environment without a person that's educated in the formal sense of the word. And so I grew up with an inferiority complex. I grew up looking at myself as being, feeling inadequate when it came to academics. And so at a young age, I knew, like all young, young children, they want to be successful in something. So you have to find what, what works for you. And for me, I knew that I had athletic abilities. I was, had fast twitch muscles, I could catch on. And so mostly all of the people that you see that are making, that are successful, on television are the actors, the entertainers, and the athletes. And so this is what I strove for. But I had a lot of insecurities outside of basketball. Right? I, didn't see my, I didn't see a future for myself academically. And so I was that person who would sit in class. Right? I would be in the back of the class. I would pray that no one would ever ask me any questions. I, could, I memorized very well. So I would memorize my way through school, but I never really learned anything. Like, never really learned anything. I would just memorize my way through it. And so when I was told that you look, all you have to do is make a C to pass, to play, that's all I was striving for was a C. And so going through that process, and I'm gonna just skip a little bit because I know I don't have a lot of time because we're gonna have question and answers at the end. Um, I put everything I had into basketball. You're taught not to put all your marbles into one basket, but this is what I did and anything could have happened. And I'm going to get to Malcolm and, and how his life changed me, but I want to give you a little backdrop of how I grew up in, in my mindset at that time. And so I would wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning and imagine a young boy at 9 years old and you feel that, man, if I don't make it in basketball, my life is over. I don't know what life's going to say, say for me. I got to put everything into this because I was scared and I didn't want to fail. And I was... Uh, and I didn't want a nine to five either. You know, so I'm, I'm waking up and it could be thundering and lightning outside. And I'm not exaggerating one bit. And I, many days I would come home, like the cold out here, it wasn't that cold, but there was a wind chill that was coming off the Gulf of Mexico. And I would literally be freezing. And I would come back home with frostbitten hands. <laughs> you know, you're shaking because we were poor. So I didn't have, I didn't have the heavy warm up suits. I would, I would have shorts on and a shirt. And I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm dribbling the ball up the court, I mean up the street to get to the basketball court. And on top of that, I had Tourette's syndrome, a neurological disorder. It's like your, your, your mind and your body on two different wavelengths. 
right? And, and they're always in negotiating, negotiating with each other, trying to find balance. And so if something didn't feel right, I had to repeat it over and over again. So to get out the house, it may take 45 minutes. Just putting on your clothes, taking them off, putting them on, taking them off, open the door, shut the door. Going up to the basketball court, I'm two, three individual people that I'm playing against. They're always this close. <sighs> if I mess up, I have to back up where I was going. I get to the court, I have to train, hour and a half. After that, I had another drill that I had to do, and it had to be perfect. And if it didn't feel perfect, I had to do that one, and that one lasts for about an hour and a half. Walking off the court, if it didn't feel right, I back up, I have to do it again. So every day almost was like a near-death experience for me, just to make it in the game of basketball, because I didn't see a future for myself academically. I didn't see where academics was going to be a way out for me. I saw that for me, this, is gonna, this has got to be it. This is life or death. I got to make it. There's no other choice. And so as I'm going through this process, we have to, uh, in order to go to college, you have to pass an ACT or SAT. And again, I could memorize. I knew how to read and write. I knew how to spell. But my comprehension skills, my, my, my critical thinking skills, terrible. Because again, all I did was memorize. And I can remember missing it by one point. And then there was this exception that they gave me. And I can say it now, I couldn't say it then because I would have, I would have been red-shirted or disqualified. But they gave me this exception where they put this woman in the room. And they gave me as much time as I needed to get through the test. And she was, she was helpful, let me, to say the least. I would, I would doing the test, and she let me answer a lot of them. But every now and then, she was a genius. I don't know how many she knew, but she would say, uh, you, sure you, wanna you sure that's the answer? And I would look at her, and I'd go read it again. And I knew I got it right when she didn't ask me the question again. <laughs> and time would go, she would hit me with it again. You sure that's the answer you want? And I would do it again. At the end of it, I ended up passing it by one point. So I was able to go to LSU. Now I'm at LSU. I'm bypassing a lot because I want to get to the meat of it. I'm at LSU, number one guard coming out in the nation. They are asking me which classes that I want, but for some reason, they put me in this room where they wanted to assess where I was intellectually. Again, I've been memorizing my way through school. I could re if I read something to you, and, and, and there were words I could spell that I didn't even know what, what, what they meant. If I read it to you, you would, you would, you would have thought, man, this, he's intelligent, until you start asking me questions. And this is what they did. I was in that, that room, and I've never been so humiliated in my life. And I'm sitting there. And the person is asking me to read, and I'm reading. After I'm thinking I'm done, I done sold it, I sound so good. And they said, well, you know what this word means? I said, no, I don't. They said, do you know what this word means? I said, no. They kept asking. The more they asked, the more humiliated and the more embarrassed I felt. And then they asked me, they said, well, what do you get out of the story? I said, I don't know. So here it is, I'm at LSU. This is my first year. To this day, it's been like 30 years. I still hold the all-time NCAA freshman scoring record of 30.2 points a game. While at LSU, I was on Sports Illustrated, I was on the cover of Street and Smiths, all these types of magazines. I'm projected if I want to, to go to the NBA that year if I wanted to. But I didn't for, for other reasons. I'm breaking records. People see me, I seem confident. I seem for sure about myself, but there was a lot of insecurities because I knew deep down inside, not even deep down inside, but I knew that there were so many other things that I was incapable of at that moment and that really all that I really had going for myself was basketball, right? I didn't feel confident intellectually. And the world didn't know that at that time, while I'm breaking records, scoring 50-something a game and 40-something a game and on the cover of these Sports Illustrated, 
that they put me in the corner of campus in this small room along with maybe another five students. And they had me in this remedial reading class where I had to learn how to read all over again in terms of being able to define words, right? To extract the moral out of the story, to think critically. And the world didn't know that this is what I was going through. And at that moment, this college coach named Dale Brown, one of those days, handed me a book that would change my life. And that was an autobiography of Malcolm. I never heard of Malcolm up to this point. Right? And I started to read his book. And this is my, this is, this, at this point is my second year. I'm a sophomore. And I'm reading his book, and I couldn't put it down. And as I'm reading it, the way his mind worked just fascinated me. I'm an athlete, so I'm competitive. I see something in people I like, I want it. I want it for myself. I want, it. I want, I want that part of that character or that mind. Like, man, how did you get there? And so I kept on reading and reading, and his life just began to fascinate me. And so fast forward. And I went through some changes. You know, that's what information does. It literally sends you through a lot of changes because I was this really reserved young man. I took a speech class in high school. Don't even know why. I don't want to talk in front of people. Like, what made me get a speech class, right? But I believe that God knew something that I didn't know, that he was preparing me for something somewhere along the way down the road. And as I get to the NBA, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. I meet this guy, and we, I had questions about my faith. And Islam came up in conversation. And I ended up going to pick up the Quran, and then from there I read about two, three pages, and I looked across the table at him, and I said, I don't know about you, but my search is over. I said, I'm going to be a Muslim. But that process of getting there, you know, when I think about as I became a Muslim, I started to reflect on my life, right? Those influences, because they say your environment has a way of molding and shaping you. The people that you come in contact with, the images that you see, the, the, the things that you hear, the things that you don't hear, all of those things communicate things to you. So, you know, I'm, I'm starting to reflect on my life, you know, that, that, uh, like, okay, why did you, Mahmoud, why were you thinking the way you were thinking? Why did you look at yourself, right, as being inadequate? Why did you have an inferiority complex? Where did this come from? And I can remember Malcolm, El Hajj Malik Shabazz would talk about the importance of knowing, your, knowing yourself, knowing your culture, knowing your history, right? That's one of the, I think one of the most dangerous things that you can do to a person is deny them access to their history and their culture and the knowledge of themselves. Because you, then you become susceptible to someone else's interpretation of who you are, and they don't always have your best interests at heart, right? And then you're all over the place. And so as I, I began to think about that, and this is as a result of reading the autobiography, because how Malcolm would just touch on so many things, you know, and, 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 and we love him, and I love him because he's a reflection of oftentimes our pain and our rage, oftentimes that we don't want to express, but he was that voice that would come out and express it. And he would interpret it in a way that, you know, gave insight to it and make you want to go and move and act upon it. And so I began to look at my life. Now I'm breaking records. I can remember having a game at LSU where I scored, at Florida, I scored 53 points as a freshman. And we beat them. I fouled out three of their guards. They come and get me for an interview. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm doing the interview. I get on the bus. I'm crying as if I heard somebody had killed my mother. <laughs> I mean, I'm crying, snot out my nose, everything. But why am I crying? You would think this was the happiest moment of my life. Man, you as close to the NBA and your goal as you could possibly be. But I was crying because I was scared. And I said, man, things like this don't happen. Uh, like this to people like me. This is too good to be true. 
Something's going to happen to me. Plane going to crash. I'm going to get hit by a bus because this don't happen to people like me. Where did I get that from? I can remember as a boy. How many of you ever heard of Sanford and Son and Good Times? And there are many other movies. But as a little boy, I could remember looking at those shows religiously, day in and day out. And as I started reflecting, your environment has a way of molding and shaping you. The things you consume, the things you hear, the things you don't hear about yourself. It is so true. One scene was a junkyard, right? The other was the projects. But they grew up relatively in the same socioeconomic background that I grew up in, right? Po you know, poor neighborhoods. And every single show, as a young boy, we were rooting for them to make it out the ghetto. Every single show. But every single show, as we get hyped, Something would happen. They would be so close to getting paid or getting, getting ahead. Something would happen to kick them right back in the ghetto. Every single show. And I'm looking at this year in and year out. And other movies I'm watching. And it's the same old story. And I said, this is why. This is why I thought that about myself. This is why I felt that way. This is why I looked at myself as being inferior. This is why I looked at myself as being inadequate. And at that moment, I vowed. I mean, when I said I vowed, I said, I'm not going to I'm not going to die like this. I'm going to live with a free conscience and a free soul, whether people like it or not. And I'm going to work hard to to take these shackles and these handcuffs off of me. And challenge, challenge, challenge myself and challenge people. So I, what, what happened was I began to read almost anything you can put in my hand. I was on a mission, that same energy I had to try to be the best basketball player that I became. I said, I got to do that with learning. I didn't know where I was going to begin. So what happened was I accepted Islam. And in, in the NBA, every city we went to, the best education that I ever received. You know, I remember an old guy telling me one time, he said, readers are your leaders, or leaders are your readers. And every city I went to almost, there would be people that would meet me in the hotel. I don't know how they found out where we were staying. But when we got into the lobby, and it would be predominantly Muslims, you would hear from the court, Salaam Alaikum, up! Salaam Alaikum, brother, how you doing? I'm a people's person. I love people. I love to talk to people. I love to learn. I love to share information. So if I felt good about you, it was a practice of mine where we would sit up all night to two, three o'clock in the morning. And I would order room service. Some people may have been good in, in history. Some may have been good in political science. And then they started, we had started having dialogue. Then they started uh, uh, introducing me to authors and books that I never heard of, the Noam Chomsky's, Gore Vidal's, Randall Robinson's, Jawanza Kunjufu's, the Arundhati Roy's, and I'm going to get them. And there was a bookstore uh, uh, in Denver, uh, Colfax, Salam Bookstores. I probably bought every book that he had, all right? And I would just read and I would have dialogue day in and day out. And I remember coming across this book called The Prince of Slaves. You know, have you ever heard of it? And it was about this brother Muslim in, uh, named Abdurrahman that was enslaved in Natchez, Mississippi, which is about two and a half hours from me. And I began to read about his story and immediately I got angry. Because as I'm reading it, and he was a captive and the, and the person who enslaved him knew his father in Timbuktu, who was an important guy, a king of sorts, a leader. And when they finally got, as I'm reading the book, you say, well, where's Timbuktu? I'm reading about Timbuktu. And the images you grow up with about Africa, right? And all of these images, these negative images, which helped to formulate how you saw yourself in a negative way. And I'm like, wow, you learned a Timbuktu. Man, they had a, it was a civilization back then. You know, they value, I mean, they had universities before oftentimes the West had universities. The number one commodity was books. They valued information. So you start learning all of this and you realize, man, if I would have knew 
If I would have known that at that age, who's to say that my mind wouldn't have been different, that I wouldn't have saw more possibilities for myself other than being a basketball player? And so it angered me to the core because now I'm thinking, what else am I missing out on? What else don't I know? And so that just put me on a search because, and I say that, this is why I say that. I spent my life trying to hone my skills to be an NBA basketball player. I finally get to the NBA. And I was thinking about this when you were talking. I said, if I'm ever fortunate to meet Malcolm someday, I believe Malcolm going to paradise, I do. We don't know, but I do. I said, if I'm ever able to meet Malcolm someday and, and I'm fortunate to be by his side in Paris, I'm, I want to thank him for sure, for his inspiration and his influence on me as a person in terms of my thinking, in terms of my behavior, in terms of my approach to morality, my approach to social justice, all of those things. But I will probably say to him at the same time, say, man, uh, could you have given me that book a little later? And I, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm serious too. You know, you spend your life developing your skills to make it somewhere. And then all of a sudden you're in the league, you're making all of this money, you're helping people. And I say, thank, thank you God for enlightening me but could you have given me another five years to make a little bit more money? <laughs> now you want to make me conscious <laughs> at this particular time in my life, <laughs> right? You know, so, but I mean, I'm the lobby. It, it, it is what it is, and I have no regrets, literally no regrets, because there's a saying, they've done studies, and I truly believe this. There's a saying in the Quran where Allah tells us, be in the company of the righteous, right? And there's a reason for that. When I used to read a lot about Malcolm and I would study his speeches and all of those things and listen to what he was saying and I'm observing his mannerisms, uh, uh, his character, uh, uh, how he uses analogies and rhetoric. I mean, just phenomenal human being. As I'm, as I'm listening to Malcolm and I'm reading his, his Excuse me. I'm so grateful that through him I developed this attitude because I really believe Malcolm had this, this mindset that the truth for him meant more than anything, that he's willing to risk everything based upon that. And there's a, they've done studies on the human being, and they said if you're not in shape, hang around people in shape. If you're not smart, hang around smart people. If you want to be moral, hang around people that are moral. Why? Because there's a language, there's a lifestyle that they've, they've, they've been conducting for so long that got them to that point. And the more you're around those people, it rubs off. At some point, it rubs off. And for me, that's been the case. And so, not just Malcolm, but through Malcolm, you know, you start, you, you, you're on a search for knowledge, right? You're on a search for information, right? You're on a search for justice. No matter, at the same time, we talked about this earlier, no, no matter who it hurts, it's not that you're trying to hurt people, but you know what? The truth means more to me than anything, and it's going to be what it's going to be. So here it is now, I'm in the NBA, I'm going through this process, and I'm coming across information that I know I have to do something with. And I'm thinking about those personalities like a El Hajj Malik Shabazz, what would he have done? Would he have been silent? You know, Arundhati Roy has a saying, she says, once you see something, you can't unsee it. To be silent, to say nothing is just as political an act as speaking out. Either way, you're accountable. I said, wow. I said, so once I see it, I'm just as accountable, right? As if I didn't see it. I mean, if I'm silent about it, I'm just as accountable once I, I say, well, shoot, I might as well go for broke and let it all hang out, right? I'm thinking about with Huey P. Newton, because this is what Malcolm was on. Malcolm was on that, that journey of always trying to evolve, 
And he was also a person that didn't mind letting you know if he was wrong. We talked about that today. Those are things that impressed me because it's hard when you're on the pinnacle. You're on this, this, this lofty, in this lofty place and people are looking at you and, and you're speaking and you got all of this knowledge and then you realize something that you said wasn't the actual thing. And he, he had the type of mindset and spirit that, hey, I was wrong on that. But he keeps it moving and he keeps challenging and he keeps pushing. And so for me, this is what Malcolm in terms of the influence that he gave. And so I started to take positions. I had to learn how to tell people no. I had to learn how to challenge people and sit with how it feels, that discomfort of people not liking what you had to say or disagreeing what you had to say. And I realized, well, that didn't kill me. And I kept going until one day I'm reading all of this information. I'm looking at what's happening in America. You know, the Noam Chomsky's, the normal Finkelsteins. I'm reading everything. And they're talking about global and domestic uh, foreign policy, global policy, and I'm coming across stuff I've never heard before. You know, since the inception of this country, they've been at war 90% of the time. 85 people control more wealth than half the population, 3.5 billion people. I'm reading books by Kianji Yamada Teller. I don't know who you know who she is. She's a professor at Princeton. Talking about we have 400 billionaires, I mean, uh, uh, 400 billionaires of 45 million people, and this is not an intersecting fact, but a parallel fact. We have that number because we have 400 billionaires because we have four, 45 million people in poverty, right? And she said, profit comes at the expense of the living wage. And I'm reading all of this stuff, and I'm coming across info. I'm like, wow, I didn't know this was going on like this. And so now I'm at the top of my game in the NBA, and they come and ask me a question about America's, you know, the system, American imperialism, the country, and I give my honest answer. And I give an answer based upon what I've been reading that's coming from a world of academics. I'm not an academic, but this is coming from an academic world. They study this all the time, but we don't always talk about it. You know, we see things, and a lot of these conversations we have in the barbershop, we have on the plane, we have on the buses, but yet for some reason we don't want to have them publicly. And this is for me, this is the thing that kind of impressed me that much more for Malcolm. Because I grew up in the 70s. I was born in 69, so I grew up in the 70s and 80s. So I grew up in the South where the relationship between blacks and whites was in your face. And I saw my mom and my, my uncles when they would be in private, how they would have conversations. And those conversations would be bold and courageous. And, but when they would, had to confront a white person, the head would be down. They would talk softer. And as a child, you grow up seeing that. And it carries over. And I was that child. And I was like, why do I, why do I feel this way? I don't like the way this feels. It don't feel natural. Why can't we just say what you want to say regardless? And so I grew up with that all of my life, right? And I, but I knew, I couldn't put my finger on it, but I knew something was wrong with that. That came from a place. And so looking at Malcolm, listening to Malcolm and breaking down the issues and being fearless, I said, man, I want that. I want to have that personality. And so I focused on him, just like those studies say, if you want to be something, hang around it. So I started reading. And so now what happened, my heroes changed. Noam Chomsky said, we don't need heroes, we need good ideas. My heroes changed. Now it wasn't Dr. J anymore. I love Dr. J. It wasn't those people anymore. Now it became thinkers, philosophers, people that have pushed the envelope for social change. Now this is what I'm consuming every day. And it's only natural, the more that you consume, the more that you surround yourself around, it starts to affect you. Your sales, your deep, whatever it is in your body, you can't see yourself doing anything else. Just like when I would envision making it to the NBA and I would go out and train and I would sit and I would meditate and I would pray and I would think. And a lot of the stuff that I thought about literally came, it developed just like that. That's another story. So as I'm going through this process, this, these other things are happening. And being in that environment of, of Malcolm and that spirit of Malcolm caused me to end up speaking my conscience. 
What do you think about the flag? I said, it's a symbol of tyranny and oppression. I said, am I saying everything in America is bad? No, there's good that exists. But wherever there's bad, even if it's in Saudi Arabia, I wanted to throw that in there because I'm a Muslim to get balance. I said, we don't stand for it. Even if it's in Gaza, wherever it is, if there's bad, we don't stand for it. We fight against it. Whether you Muslim, non-Muslim, woman, man, injustice is injustice. It's universal. Don't stand for it, period. So I'm having this conversation. I say, God didn't put two hearts in the human being, one for justice and one for injustice. You only got one. So I'm having this dialogue. But of course, the media took it, and they ran with tyranny, oppression, tyranny, oppression. Didn't focus on the other. Now I'm on a roll, right? Because I'm being influenced by the personality of Malcolm and these other personalities that I'm learning about. And then 9-11 happened. And I missed out on my chance to be in the league for, for some years. And I just snuck back in. And what do they do? They come and ask me a question. And I give them my honest answer based upon a lot of the information that I'm reading and not just mainstream information. And Korea was destroyed as a result of that. But I remember someone telling me one time, they said, you know, if you're looking at a system and you think the system is flawed or if you think the system is wrong or unjust, you know, they say your oppressor would never voluntarily give you freedom. You have to demand it. You have to fight for it. But they also said, they said that if those who you consider enemies of yours or saying great things about you, something is wrong. So I took it as a compliment. Because I really believe that. And, and, and there's so much we can talk about tonight in terms of Malcolm. Like, even when I think about his speeches that he gave here in Erickson Center. If we listen to what he was saying, and I say this all the time, if we go back in the 50s and 60s, a lot of the conversations, the things that they were fighting for, racial inequality and all of those things, economic, e economic equality, racial equality, uh, all of those things. What has changed now? We're having the same conversations. If you take those black and white images on television and you take the images that we're in the conversations that we're having in this day and time in 2000, 2014, and you make them black and white, you don't hear the sound, you put it on silent. We probably won't know the time we're living in. Probably won't. And so one of the things that also intrigued me about Malcolm, and we don't do this enough, and it may upset some people, but that's okay. One thing we don't do enough, we're constantly going in a cycle, like from the inception of this country to now, right? If if we look at a world where we have 85 people that have more wealth than 3.5 billion people on the planet, if, po if segregation now, according to the studies, is worse now than it was then, if poverty now is worse now than it was then, but yet we're still asked to do, go through the same cycle to bring about change, it's not designed to bring about freedom. It's not designed to bring about change. And the one thing Malcolm talked about a lot, it's criminal. When you talk, nonviolence has its place. I don't even like to word, use the word violence because it has a negative connotation. I like to use the word armed resistance. But nonviolence, he said, is criminal to teach a man, right? To teach a man not to defend himself when he is the victim of brutal attacks. So when you look at the system and when you look at, and we talked about this in the car, I think one of the most fascinating things, literally the most fascinating things to exist in the world is you have a small minority of people that control the mind of the majority and that will still go in a cycle, still go in a cycle. They say it literally, we are mostly, everybody in this country is two to three paychecks from being on the street. Medium income people, 
We have nice homes and nice cars, but technically underneath all of that, we are on the verge of poverty. They've done a study, European study, that America is now considered a third world country. Over 40 million people or more don't have life ins uh, health insurance. And you have third world countries that give access to that. So how am I to look at this as an exceptional place? Yes, there's good, but there's so much bad, I don't have time to talk about the good. That's my motto, that's my focus. That's what I'm on, Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, that's what I'm on. Because too many people, and this ain't about just black, ain't about just Muslims. Everybody's suffering, everybody. Even when you look at the dynamics of the, even if we're thinking racially, if we look at the dynamics between whites and blacks, it said just for a, a person of my color to reach economic parity, right, with a, with a white person would take 300 and something years because of the generational effects of slavery. There's so much work that needs to be done on so many levels. You can pick any industry, institution in this country. Please do. There's so many books out there from scholars and from academics that's dropping on these things day in and day out. And there's so many problems, but we continue to ignore it. We don't talk about it. But from my study, from my, from my study of history, this is what I've come across, and this is what I think Malcolm was also trying to say. But when he would say something like that, obviously he's branded as a hate monger. No, it's criminal. Even Jesus, peace be upon him, in the Bible at one time, told his disciples to sell your garments and buy swords. But we'll hear the peace loving, the turn the other cheek. Yeah, there's a time and a place for that. Even Martin Luther King, towards the end of his life, his views change. He said, I, I feel that I'm pushing my, my followers into a burning building. He started talking about the evils of this country in terms of its capitalism, its materialism. Right? People start to see it, but not enough is speaking about it. But through my, my studies, through my reading, any substantial change that have come about, it's not just through voting. It's not just having emergency meetings and policy papers pass from room to room. You hear a lot of these politicians today. Most every time you look at the news, we have a meeting, convene another meeting, we got this policy paper, we're gonna pass this vote, by the time you finish, there's another 30,000 people that's going to be slaughtered. You stalling. You window dressing. Don't go for it. We shouldn't, we, shouldn't, we, sh we shouldn't go for it. It's in our eyes. So much of this stuff is in our eyes. But we continue to ignore it. And Arundhati Roy, again, once you see something, you can't unsee it. To be silent, to say nothing, is just as political an act as speaking out. Either way, you're accountable. We know these things exist. And it's only when people have stood up, when they had the fight, when they had George uh, Floyd, the murder. There was a lot of protesting. Nothing was done until those people took it a little further and made it physical and jammed those that po police precincts in the police station. How they tell you, oh, it takes, it takes time, we gotta, to pass a law. We gotta send it through this measure, this measure, this measure. No, it don't. You can pass it if you want to, quick. You can make a change if you quick. You stonewall it, I mean, you, you, you stall it. When they hem them up in that police precinct, they, t they pass two, three laws almost overnight. History shows us this. When I'm overseas, I don't know how many times I'm on my way to the gym in Greece. They say, hey, man, you got to delay practice. But why? <sighs> they got to protest. They tan some stuff up at the, uh, the, the Capitol building. I say, why? They went up three cents on the bread. Huh? Yeah. They don't play. I, but it made sense to me. Why? The people understood if you go up three cents, we don't do anything, you're going to go up seven cents. Then you're going to go up 15 cents. Then before you know it, a carton of milk is going to be $10. But our minimum wage and our living wage ain't going to go up. 
and we're going to be working two, three jobs just to make ends meet. We're going to be living to work, not working to live. They understood that. And if you look at every, from my understanding, mostly every ch substantial change that happened, it happened according to what Malcolm said. It's criminal to teach a man not to defend himself. And he spoke about revolution and what it does and what it's involved with. And this, literally, this country, as beautiful as it is, there is there's so many problems in it. And one that we hear about every single day that's happening in occupied Palestine right now, constantly. And you have people constantly having meetings over and over again. Imagine babies amputated with no anesthesia. This, and mostly women and children are dying. Congo, Sudan, everywhere. And America has its hand in almost every conflagration and war that's going on in this country. So as we're here to revisit Malcolm, Amos N. Wilson says something, and I'm, I'm going to probably end. Amos N. Wilson says something that, matter of fact, where is it? I'm going to read it. He said, if our revisiting history, and this is what we're doing, also revisiting the life of Malcolm, his thought, his, uh, uh, his approach to issues. He said, if, we're, if our revisiting history is merely an exercise in feeling good about ourselves, then we will die feeling good. We must analyze the lessons this history teaches us. We must understand the tremendous value of studying uh, this history for the purpose of regaining power. If our education, if our educating ourselves is not about real power, we are being miseducated and misled, and we will die mis miseducated and misled. And he also said, to manipulate history is to manipulate consciousness. To manipulate consciousness is to manipulate possibilities, and to manipulate possibilities is to manipulate power. I think about this book by Christopher Ryans. It's called Civilized to Death. Right? We talk about how civilized we are as a nation. And it, go get the book if you can. If you, if you haven't read it, but he's making the comparison because we're constantly told how he talks about this, uh, this narrative of perpetual progress. Just because things move forward, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're progressing. He uses dentistry. He talks about a lot of different things, childbirth. And he makes comparisons thousands of years ago to now. And you'd be amazed at his findings. But one thing in particular that he was talking about, there was this group in London. They found some tribal people in Brazil. They took them to London because they wanted to show them, look, this is what I want to convince you and influence you to turn your tribe into a civilization. So when they go there, the guy is sitting in the house day in and day out. So one day he decides to ask the tribe from Brazil. He said, let me, let, me, uh, let me ask you something. He said, you leave in the morning. You don't come back tonight. Why are you, why are you going all the time? I mean, you don't, you don't spend time with your family to build or nothing. He said, man, I got to pay for this house. He said, he said, I got a mortgage. He said, what do you mean? He said, it's expensive. It's like 30 year mortgage. If I don't pay for it. He said, well, where I'm from, if we want a house built, we get the community together. We just build it. Now, which one is more civilized? But we've been conditioned to think this is civilized to have this huge mortgage that you'll die. Probably never pay. You keep going in debt every single day. They raise. It's a game. One person saw where there was a group of people at the house of wealthy people. And they were skinny. They, they didn't have no food. I said, what are you doing? He said, they got the money. We're trying to get something to eat. And something to eat. He, said, he said, where we're from, if people hoard money and don't allow it to circulate, we give them a soft warning. After that, we deal with you. What's more civilized? The society is always more important than the individual. This is, this, is, this is my belief. This is what I believe Malcolm's belief was. And all of those people. You know, I remember something that Huey P. Newton said. I'm going to end with this because I can keep going. Huey P. Newton. Uh, he has a book called Revolutionary Suicide. And he was talking about the difference between revolutionary suicide and reactionary suicide. In other words, revolutionary suicide, giving your life for a cause. 
And he said something that resonated with me. and I haven't forgotten. He said, it's not that we have a death wish. This is not the case at all. He said, it's quite the opposite. He said, it's that we have such a desire to live with peace and dignity that the existence without it is impossible. We have such a desire to live with dignity and peace that the existence without it is impossible. This is what my hope is for every last one of us in here. That when it's all said and done, irrespective of our ethnicity, our color, our religion, that when we unpack it all, it's all about really, and I know these are words that people throw up all the time, but I mean really, that it's about justice, it's about equality, it's about fairness. It's like the concept of Ubuntu, where they had this anthropologist created a game among African children, take this tree at a far distance, and say, whichever one of you can get to that tree first can have it all for themselves. Because we grew up in that type of society too. We're taught to be individuals. And he thought that they were gonna run and get it and keep it individually. But instead they looked at each other, they grabbed arms and they ran to the tree together. And when they got there, he said, why did you do that? They said, Ubuntu. They said, this is a psychology among African tribes. Right? How can I be happy when the rest of us are sad? I am because we are. Right? We're all in this. And I know th these, are, these are cliches, but it doesn't mean that it's less true. We're technically all in this together. And the more that we stop being silent, the more that we start really thinking conceptually and analyzing all of these things, and I'm still learning. I have a long way to go. Long, long way to go. The more we start standing up and being firm, and following through as a collective, then these things will start to dissipate and, and they'll change. Outside of that, if we keep going through the system that they've created, that hasn't changed anything, if you take the black and whites, if you take the same conversation, we're having the same conversations. Things have gotten worse, not better. So how, why should we still follow the same model for change? It doesn't work, we need a new model. So this is uh, Malcolm's contribution to me as an individual. And I still read his, his mess, uh, listen to his speeches. I still read his books because there's always something still to learn in what he left us. And I'm super grateful to be in this, spa this space with you. And I'm looking forward to the questions and the dialogue after. May God continue to bless you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. Um, now is the time for questions. We have some time here. If you want to scan the QR code or go to slido.com and put in that number, you can enter your questions. And we already have some questions here. The first question is, while my phone loads the page here. All right. Let's start from the first one here. Um, <laughs> Do you believe you got justice for how you were treated in your career? Oh, that's a good one. No, I don't. Um, it's, it's one thing if, um, it's kind of like when you look at the situation with Kaepernick, right? Um, I don't think there's anything that I said was untrue. The NBA has, they have causes that they, that they embrace. And they'll pull in players to support those causes. Um, um, they, they didn't, there was no rule in the NBA at the time. My, my, my agent at the time was Sharif Nasir, Muslim guy. And we looked into it, and they fined me and suspended me because they say there was a rule in the NBA that I had to stand. Come to find out, there was no rule in the NBA that I had to stand. 
uh, and they just pretty much made it up. Even the guy that finds people, uh, he wanted to find me $1,000 a sock because the NBA emblem wasn't being shown. So this, this is a guy, he know, he's, he's, he's supposed to know the rules and everything. And he even said, he said, man, there's no rule in the NBA that you gotta stand, right? So the fact that they suspended me and fined me, but that's not the worst of it. It's really the after effects. Because it's kind of like what happened with Kaepernick. And the playbook is the same. When they want you out, they know that there are laws that protect you. They can't say, I find, I'm, I'm, I'm getting rid of you because you didn't stand for the flag. But what they'll do is, when you go to that next team, because there's relationships. We all know there's relationships in business, in the world that we live in. There's cliques. Because uh, Kaepernick and whoever else, I forget his name, they won a collusion lawsuit in the NFL because they were able to find out. But you go to the, the ne the, your next city, your minutes decline. When your minutes decline, what happens is now, ah, we don't know if he can play anymore. And so now it's easy to get rid of you based on those conditions. So no, I, I don't think uh, that I got justice uh, whatsoever. I'm not, I know there's a reason for everything. And if it's meant to be, it'll be. But also, um, I'm not depressed. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for where I'm at now. Uh, if that wouldn't have happened, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. I don't know that. So I'm just, uh, but I don't think I got justice. No, not at all. Well, speaking of the league, what are your thoughts on current players staging counter protests in reaction to social justice initiatives taken, a large, taken by a large segment of the league? I'm referring to Jonathan Isaacs and Enos Freedom's, Enos Freedom's actions since the 2019 to 20 season who have invoked religion to uphold the status quo and perpetuate oppression. Do you view this as an affront to your and Malcolm's legacy? Hold on, you gave me a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. Let's just, let's just keep it the first part of it. No, no, hit me with it again, because I sure. want So what are your thoughts on current players staging counter protests in reaction to social justice initiatives taken by a large segment of the league? I'm referring to Jonathan Isaacs and Ennis Freedom's actions since the 2019 to 20 season who have invoked religion to uphold the status quo and perpetuate oppression. Do you view this as an affront to your and Malcolm's legacy? Well, the first part of that, uh, it's necessary for anyone, if you see an injustice, if you think something is wrong, to take a position on it. Uh, there's, there can be arguments, people are gonna have arguments. Uh, look, everybody has to make a decision that's, that's good for them. Uh, people, a person will think about their job, They'll think about their families. I get it. Look, I was married. My wife at the time, when I had the HBO interview was coming, uh, I said, look, I have to do it. Uh, I, I agreed to do an HBO interview. She had that look on her, I mean, like she was like. I said, what? She said, why? I said, because I agreed to it. She said, what you going to say? I said, I'm going to say what I believe to be true. She said, yeah, but when you give interviews and you... She said, people burn down our house, we don't get no job. And so I looked at her, I said, you know what? I said, I apologize. I said, I apologize to you in advance and my children in advance. I said, but I've grown up a certain way and I used to be a certain way. And I said, I made a commitment to myself that I wanna live and die with a free conscience and a free soul whether people like it or not. And I said, so I'm, 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 I'm apologizing to you in advance if, if anything comes out of this that that is detrimental to you. I said, but this is the man that I'm trying to become and this is the man that I'm aiming for and I'm not turning back on that. That was my position, right? Some people may say, look, I wanna try this approach and that approach, but I think everybody, and just like what I talked about before, silence is not gonna help us, right? I think if you see something and you have a heart for it, address it. I really believe it. And I think, and I'm, I'm, I'm a religious guy. So I believe that anything that's destined for me, you ain't gonna be able to keep it from me. And whatever ain't destined for me, you ain't gonna be able to give it to me. So this is my approach. Now, the last part of that, I think when they were saying something about perpetuating oppression, well, if oppression is perpetuated, no, you wanna 
I don't, I don't agree with that, then yes, that's, a, that's an affront to Malcolm and whoever else who fought for those things. But I'd have to have more specifics. I don't know those, that case with them. Let's do one more sports question and then we'll move on. Um, let's see, it was a good question. Where was it? Oh yeah, how do you feel about youth who look at sports figures as role models or idols? Just choose a good one. <laughs> I mean, because nobody's perfect. Look, you, you, have, you have priests that have the cloak on as committing, you know, despicable acts. You have politicians, you have academics. I mean, nobody's perfect. So, you know, there's this, there's this stereotype that, and it's not, I mean, that athletes are, you know, not necessarily, you know, I mean, you got intelligent athletes. You know, look at Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He's a writer, you know, Etan Thomas, right? You got what, the guy that's a politician that's been, for years, Brad, Bill Bradley, back in the day. So, uh, I think about that, uh, back in the day, J. Edgar Hoover, now it's declassified, right? Back in the day, J. Edgar Hoover, and I'm just paraphrasing, you know, you had the Muhammad Ali's, right? You had people that stood for stuff. You had Paul Robeson's, you had a lot of people. They were intelligent, they took positions, and they're made examples of all the time. Well, J. Edgar Hoover came out with, during that time, the COINTELPRO and, and, and the decimation of the black messiah and all of that, these leaders like Martin Luther King coming up, we got, if you go back and read it, he was mentioning how we have to, I'm paraphrasing, we have to promote pretty much the brain dead athlete away from the conscientious athlete, right? Because they understood the power, because athletes, not that it's right, not that it's right, but the visibility that sports give you, a lot of these children will listen to oftentimes who they admire in an athlete or entertainer before they're gonna to listen to a professor or before they listen to their parents. So he understood the power of the athlete, the right athlete. So, you know, promote this one and promote that one. They don't really, they're not taking a position, they're neutral, which means really they don't stand for this and they stand for that. We'll promote them over somebody that's conscientious, that's gonna challenge your thoughts, challenge the system, right? Make you feel uncomfortable, right? You have to sit with that. And so, I would say, no, just, listen, I, I wouldn't go against it. I would just, with whoever you follow, just make sure they're worthy of following. Yeah, whether they're athlete or not. You were, you were born and raised as Chris Jackson. Why and how did you choose your name, Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, after reverting to Islam? Um, I, I was in the masjid. Uh, the imam and another brother called me into the office. Uh, he said, have you chosen a name? I said, nope. I said, I only know a few names. And one said, well, I think Mahmoud would be a good name for you. I said, I heard all of them have beautiful meanings. No problem. The other one said, I think Abdul Rauf would be a good name for you. I said, again, I heard all of them have beautiful meanings. Mahmoud means elegant, praiseworthy. Abdul Rauf, the servant of the, the most kind. Uh, little did I know that I'm not good with names. When I meet people, I'm better with faces initially. I'm back and forth in the community two weeks. So I hear somebody referring to the guys that gave me the names. Come to find out the one that gave me Mahmoud and the one that gave me Abdul Rauf, that was their names. <laughs> and, they, and they wanted me to have their names. And then afterwards they give me a book on the names. And I'm like, man, y'all should have gave me this first. <laughs> because I, you know, I like the sound of Suleiman. And then I like the sound Mujahid. Mujahid means a striver for truth. I said, man, I, would have been, man, I could have chosen Mujahid. <laughs> but the community knew me as Mahmoud. It was like two weeks or so. I said, I'm going to just go ahead and keep it. <laughs> yeah. um, that period when you chose not to stand for the national anthem, of course, it was before the media ran with it. You had been doing that for some time. Yeah. When the media ran with it, I wonder if you could describe that period of time in your life, like, what was, what was that like? Were, were, did your teammates support you? What was that like? Uh, yeah, I'd been doing it the previous year for about four months. And I, it really, I never intended for it at that, to, at that time. Now, yeah, was it going to come out? Yes. I wasn't running away, but I was also still searching. I was still trying to figure out the world around me. 
right? I was reading things. I'm like, man, this don't make sense. No, I ain't for that. I ain't for this. And so this is why I stopped standing. Because I said, well, you know, it doesn't represent what you say it represents from my studies, right? And so I can't stand for that. Then when I'm reading Quran and Allah tells us he didn't put two hearts in the individual, right? He only put one. You can't be for justice and injustice, right? And all of these other things about our prophet. And then even when I think about Malcolm and other people, right? And so I'm like, no, nah, I, can't, I can't do it because it's a symbol to me of that. And I would, I would pretend to be stretching. There were times I would get up and I would face the other way. Uh, but the media would say, oh, he, uh, he would go to the bathroom. And I, no, I didn't. I went to the bathroom a couple of times because I had to use it. But I didn't go because of that. And make a long story short, Todd Ely, the assistant GM, said that there was this radio personality. And he came out on the radio, I think, the hitman. Uh, actually, it was, uh, and, and he saw that I wasn't standing. He wanted to talk to me. And I told Todd Ely, I said, look, man, we talk about this stuff all the time. I said, regardless, I said, no problem, we can have a conversation. So after I talked to him, that's when it gained traction. Then the next day, we're playing, we're playing Shaquille O'Neal, Orlando Magic. And I'm thinking, I mean, you see so many journalists. And I'm like, well, they're not here for us. They're probably here for Shaq, because that was his first year. And they beeline straight to me. And the first question they asked me, hey, what do you think about, uh, what do you think about the flag? So I spoke my conscience. I did. Because you, you hear this stuff all the time. Right. I mean, you hear even politicians griping about certain things about America. The books, they're out there. So I'm thinking, OK, but the power of the athlete, the power of visibility, the power of influence. But I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to say what I got to say back to the game. I came back to the arena that night. I'm getting ready to get my stuff on. Jim Gillen says uh, Bernie wants to see you at the end of the office. I mean, at the end of the hall. It's okay. And they were looking at me strange. So I go down and say, yeah, what's going on, Bernie? He was the GM at the time. He said, the NBA called. Uh, they want to suspend you and fine you. On the count of you not standing, what do you say? He said, I'm not going to do it. He said, well, they want, to, they want to talk to you. So they got on the phone and they started having a conversation with me, trying to convince me. I don't remember who it was. I wish I, wish I would have been that type of person that wrote down names. But I do remember them trying to convince me. And they identified themselves as Jewish. And again, make this clear. We make a distinction, right? Just like we make a distinction between Muslims and terrorists, we make a distinction between Zionists and Judaism. We make this distinction. That could be another conversation. But in case somebody's, because I mentioned Jewish. But they said, well, you know, we're Jewish. And they gave me an example. And the example that they gave me, I'm listening. And when they finished, I said, well, I appreciate you giving me that, sharing that with me. Uh, thank you. But this particular example doesn't apply to me. I said, so I'm still not going to stand. And, and it didn't apply because they were Jewish. It's just the example you gave, that ain't what I agree with. And that's when they, they, they defined me. And I'm thinking, I've never been fined and, and suspended in my life. I'm thinking there's going to be an act of Congress. You got to go through process. So I said, Bernie, can I go to the, uh, can I go get my clothes on? He said, no. I said, I'm suspended right now? He said, yeah. I said, well, can I go put my clothes on and sit in the arena and root for the team? He says, no. He said, they don't even want you on the premises. So that's when I left. And then before you know it, I look up. It's, it's global that fast. It's all over the world because this young little black athlete who happened to be a Muslim said something about America. Not that it was wrong what I said. They just didn't like the fact that I said it. And so let's make an example of him. It's kind of like what Noam Chomsky talks about, the threat of a good example. So we crush you. We're going to send a message to everybody else that if you do this, same thing going to happen to you. So be careful. Right? And, and you see this played out a lot, like even with uh, when Westbrook and James Harden was in China with the Uyghur situation. And they said, well, we are, you know, we were progressive, the NBA, and we allow our athletes to speak out. Yeah, it depends on the politics. And so they were getting ready to say something. And somebody from the NBA said, no, you're not going to answer that. I said, I thought y'all were, I thought you allowed your players to speak out. But it just depends on 
what they agree with and what they don't. You want to try to control your voice. We have time for a couple of questions. First one is, when you did finally stand, and you would stand and make a, a, a prayer, a dua, an invocation, do you mind sharing maybe what you would pray for? It, it would vary, because I, I was reading a lot, right? So, like now, what's happening in Gaza, and what's in the Congo, and what's in Sudan, and, and then just the everyday problems that's happening in this country. It, a lot of times it just will be a general, general, you know, Allah, please uh, allow us as an Ummah, right, to, 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 to develop Tawheed, you know, to unite with your oneness, uh, eradicate poverty, you know, uh, bring enlightenment to people to see the truth, to expose falsehood. Uh, depending on what I was reading, I would just pray for those people who were going through, through challenges and suffering. Um, um, but mostly it was in line of eradicating, you know, oppression, bringing about universal justice to the, I mean, because we're always going to have it. We know that life is just going to always be that way. But for the most part, put a major dent in it and uh, expose those people that need to be exposed. Um, yeah. So will be the last question. A lot of questions here mentioning um, the, the horror of Gaza, what's going on in Gaza and elsewhere. How do we oppose injustice and still build a sense of community across our country? I think they go hand in hand. I think the fact, I mean, there's no cooker cutter approach. Every community is different, every person is different. But the fact that you're opposing injustice, I think once you oppose something wrong and corrupt, eventually uh, 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 other opportunities and other scenarios will develop. Right, and it becomes, uh, what's the word? Not like a domino, but um, a, ripple a ripple effect. You know, so, uh, but I think the first stage, you know, it's, it's like sometimes we uh, have these conversations and you have people, well, you know what, I don't wanna, I wanna learn all that I have to learn. I wanna learn as much as I can. I wanna know everything before I move forward. Well, you'll never know everything. That almost assures you you're not gonna do anything. So my, my, my approach has always been whatever little I know or think I know, I'm going to move on it and God going to show me the rest. Right. Even, you know, you're not always going to have all of the steps there. But if you know that this thing right here I need to oppose, oppose it. And then along the way, you may, oh, this comes up and that come up. That's how a lot of things happen. Like even talking to people that's in, in social organizing and move, movements, some of them didn't even know. They said, man, we did this. And then we found out this, and this is how this organization was evolved. evolved. And so I would just say the fact that you know there's an injustice, take a position on it. And this is what, this is what I think hinders us a lot, because we're thinking too much of A, B, C, D, E, F, right? As opposed, no, I'm just going to do this, and God, you show me the way. You know, I don't care if it's small. Show me the way. I did that, right? And, and I'm seeing it happens all the time. So, no, I don't think that it will, uh, I think they go hand in hand. I think they go hand in hand. Um, that's, that's more I can say. But that's one aspect of it. I mean, you definitely want to, it, it's nice to have knowledge to have insight on things, because some people will just do something because I know this is wrong. So the more knowledge you have, obviously, too, and, and you're constantly, I'm big on reading everything I can because I've learned over the years that there's an intersectionality, I know that's a word, uh, with information, right? Sometimes you realize that, uh, I think what's-his-name talks about this in his book, Paul Gatto. Uh, he has a book called The Amer uh, Underground History of American Education. And he talks about how a lot of times subjects are so separated, like they don't make the connection. Like if you're in, uh, if you're in this political science and if you're in this class, how do I, how do I study the, this material and make a whole lot of them? Things are so compartmentalized, right? Well, you, you can't see the, how they apply to each other. And it's no wonder why you have so many people with great ideas, but then they don't know how to put them together. Like, man, they got a great idea, but they don't have no follow through. And a lot of that stuff comes from, because we're not all educated the same, right? Uh, and we don't all learn the same. So there are methods 
And so I think me personally, I think that has hindered a lot of us, like me studying history and then me studying uh, political science and me, and there always seems to be disconnected. So you grow up, you know, not knowing how to put things together. And he talks about that in his book, why are things this way? Like you should show the intersectionality, how all of this stuff comes together as a whole so you can see the full picture. And so this is a part of our problem. You know, I may not be expressing it particularly the way I want to, but I, I think it's important to start looking. I would tell my children, teach me something I don't know every day. And, and, and I would tell this one, give me something in history, give me something here, give me something here. And we always try to say, okay, now how can we make sense of all of this stuff? You know, how can we pull it together? Um, yeah, so I, I think that's important also. But at the end of the day, if you see something and you know something needs to be done, just do it. And trust that along the way you'll, you'll, you'll find the next step to take. I could keep going. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank I you so much. It. Please join me in thanking Abdul Rauf. Thank you. 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 Thank